Hello and welcome back to Hilbert Spaces, the video series where we extend our common knowledge of geometry to infinite dimensional spaces. And in today's part 13, we will talk about Parseval's identity, which is a famous statement about orthonormal systems. In fact, it simply transforms Bessel's inequality into an equality. However, as always, before we start with the formulas, I first want to thank all the nice people who support this channel on Steady, here on YouTube or via other means. And please don't forget, as a Steady supporter, you can download a lot of additional material with the link in the description. For example, you can download the PDF version of this video, which might help you to understand what we talk about today. And as you already know, we will talk about an inner product space X, where we fix an orthonormal system. Here I already should emphasize that everything in this video does not need the completeness, so we don't need a Hilbert space, we just have an inner product space here. And as in the former videos, we will take an ONS and denote the elements by E alpha, where alpha goes through an index set I. Indeed, we can already assume that this index set I is an infinite set, because the finite dimensional case is not so hard. We already talked a lot about finite dimensional Hilbert spaces in the linear algebra course. In other words, the generalization to the infinite dimension is what we are interested in. So for example, if you fix an element x in our inner product space, we could look at all the inner products x with the ONS. So E alpha with x in the inner product and we only need the ones that are non-zero. So we only need the indices from i that have a non-vanishing contribution here. And now it turns out, no matter how high the infinity for i is, this set is always countable. So it's either finite or it has the same cardinality as the natural numbers. So this is what we call a countable set. And this nice property for any O and S immediately follows from Bessel's inequality. So let's recall this important inequality from the last video. It simply tells us that the sum over the squares of the inner products here stay below the norm of x squared. And it holds regardless which finite subset j in i is considered. Which also implies if we include more and more terms in the sum, the terms we include have to get smaller and smaller. So for example, consider the set of indices where the absolute value of this inner product here is greater or equal than a given 1 over n. This one definitely has to be a finite set for every given natural number n. Simply because if it was an infinite set, you could take as many elements as you want from this set and eventually violate Bessel's inequality. Then, in the next step, we can just form the union of this set over all natural numbers. So it's a countable union of countable sets, which means the result is also a countable set. And now, as you might see, the resulting set is exactly the set we were interested in before. So this finishes our proof. Our index set i can be really huge, but the corresponding set we have here can only be countable. This is important because we will often use the sum symbol over the index set i. This means we can only calculate with that if the sum symbol makes sense. For example, we will often see the combination E alpha with E alpha like that, where alpha goes through the whole index set i. And there we already know that only countably many elements contribute to this sum at all. Hence, instead of i, we could say we have i0, where i0 is a countable subset of i. And since we only consider the case that i is an infinite set, we could also take i0 as an infinite set as well. So depending on x, this could also be chosen as a finite set, but we don't want to do it, we still want to stay at infinity. Hence, i0 is possibly larger than we actually need it, but then we don't have to distinguish two cases. More precisely, it guarantees that we can always find a bijection to the natural numbers. And usually we can call such a bijection an enumeration of the set. Which means y0 can be written as alpha1, alpha2 and so on. So by having this bijection to the natural numbers, we finally have an order on i0 
and can give a meaning to this infinite sum. In other words, now we can just consider the indices j, where j goes from 1 to n. This one is just a finite linear combination, so a well-defined element in our inner product space x. Therefore, the only question is, does this sequence in x converge with respect to the norm in x? So you see, we have two questions to answer here. First, does this limit exist for any enumeration we can choose for i0? And second, is this limit then independent of the chosen enumeration? So if we get 2 times yes, then our strange infinite sum is well defined. So only in that case we are allowed to use this strange notation for an element in our vector space x. And as we will see today, Parseval's identity will help us to answer these two questions. So I would say, let's immediately go there, let's formulate the important theorem of the day. And as already mentioned, we will formulate Parseval's identity without using any completeness, so we just take a general inner product space x. And moreover, as before, we also choose an orthonormal system in the inner product space. And now the theorem tells us that we have Parseval's identity if and only if we have actually an O and B. And there, please recall, an orthonormal basis is simply a total O and S by definition. Moreover, Parseval's identity is just Bessel's inequality without the inequality. More precisely, we have that the norm of x squared is equal to the infinite sum. And there we already know it's a well-defined countable infinite series where the absolute value squared goes in. This is what we call Parseval's identity and it just tells us that in the case of an O and B, Bessel's inequality becomes an identity. However, it also works the other way around, which means if we have Parseval's identity for every x in x, then we necessarily have an O and B. In addition to that, I want to show you two more equivalent statements which nicely connect to what we have done before. Namely, Parseval's identity also guarantees that the limit from above always exists. And moreover, this limit is always equal to the originally chosen vector x. In order to explain this convergence in a more precise way again, we could say that we consider the distance between x and the finite linear combination given by this combination again. So as before, this means that we choose an enumeration of the essential part of the O and S. And then when n tends to infinity, this distance goes to zero. So exactly this is what we mean when we say that we have convergence with respect to the norm in x. Moreover, in a similar way, we also have such a convergence when we consider the inner product between two vectors. So just take two vectors x and y and consider the inner product y with x. Then this can be reformulated by taking an infinite sum with the O and S again. However, there we first have y with e alpha and then e alpha with x. So you can just remember that we have e alpha in the middle and the convergence of the series is given in a similar way as before. Indeed, it's even a little bit simpler because here we just have convergence of complex numbers. Therefore, this convergence can be just written with respect to the absolute value in C. Otherwise, it's exactly the same thing as before. It does not matter which enumeration we choose. We always get this convergence to zero when we send n to infinity. So there we have it. These are the nice equivalences we have for an O and B, and they are usually described by Parseval's identity. However, I can also tell you an informal way to summarize these properties. There, some people just say, when we use the infinite sum together with the unit vectors e alpha and e alpha in the inner product, then nothing really happens, so it acts like an identity operator. For example, here we get x out again when we put in x, and here we get y x out when we put in y and x in the inner product. Therefore, the informal way would be to say that this combination is equal to the identity operator on x. In fact, it's a notation you might see a lot in quantum mechanics, but it's essentially just an informal way of writing the equivalences we have stated here. 
so you can definitely use it as a mnemonic device to remember Parsevite's identity. Now indeed showing these equivalences is not too complicated, but I want to show you all the details, so let's do it in the next video. So I really hope I meet you there for the calculations and have a nice day. Bye bye.